All right, let's get started with section three. And here's that focus question. Public debate in the late 19th century, more than any other point in American history, divided along class lines. The shift from debates over slavery and the status of formerly enslaved people to what one politician called the overwhelming labor question was clear in 1877, when Reconstruction ended and the first national strike began, the Great Railroad Strike. Railroad workers protesting pay cuts paralyzed rail traffic in much of the country. Militia units tried to force them back to work, and after troops fired on strikers and killed 20 in Pittsburgh, workers rioted and burned property, and strikes spread to other workplaces. General strikes brought Chicago and St. Louis to a halt. The event showed a new solidarity among workers and close ties between the Republican Party and a new class of industrialists. In the aftermath, the federal government built armories in major cities to make sure troops would be on hand to help crush future uprisings. There was a new wave of labor organizing in the 1880s, and the Knights of Labor stood at its center. The Knights were the first labor group to organize unskilled workers as well as skilled women and men and blacks as well as whites, although the Knights on the West Coast excluded Asian immigrants. In its peak year, 1886, the Knights had around 800,000 members and involved millions of workers in strikes, boycotts, and political, social, and educational activities. Labor reformers in this era presented a wide range of hopes and demands, from anarchism and socialism to the eight-hour day and a desire for a cooperative commonwealth. They all agreed that new social conditions were highly unequal and required drastic change. The labor movement challenged the prevailing definition of freedom as liberty of contract, arguing that Americans had lost control over their livelihoods and their government. Workers were not the only ones dissatisfied with social conditions. A sense of alarm at social changes wrought by industrial capitalism spread through all classes. Social thinkers offered many different ideas and blueprints for change, and at the end of the 19th century, an unprecedented number of utopian and dystopian novels were published, including Caesar's Column by Ignatius Donnelly, in which civilization was destroyed in a brutal war between workers and businessmen. The most popular books offering remedies for the unequal distribution of wealth were Progress from Poverty from 1879 by Henry George, The Cooperative Commonwealth from 1884 by Lawrence Gronland, and Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward from 1888. All three books were bestsellers and spoke to the growing belief that American society was deeply flawed. Progress and Poverty had no direct influence on policy, but it attracted more attention than any other book on economics in American history. In the 1850s and 1860s, Henry George had witnessed the monopolization of land in California. His book suggested that the major problem facing America was the growth of poverty alongside material progress, and his solution was the single tax which would replace all other taxes with the tax on increases in land values. The single tax would be so high that it would prevent land speculation in the city and countryside. Although not all embraced his solution, many people were stirred by his identification of the social problem. Gronland's book, The Cooperative Commonwealth, was the first to popularize socialism for an American audience. Socialism, the idea that private control of economic enterprises should be replaced by a government ownership in order to ensure a fairer distribution of the benefits of the wealth produced, was a major political force in Western Europe in the late 19th century. But in the United States, where private property was seen as essential to individual freedom, socialism was mostly confined to immigrants, whose foreign language writings reached few people. Gronland was the first to Americanize social, uh, socialism. While Karl Marx had predicted that socialism would be achieved through a working class revolution, Gronlin believed it would be achieved by peaceful evolution and thus made it more acceptable to middle class Americans terrified by class conflict and the prospect of social revolution. Socialism was not popular until the early 20th century, but Gronlin's work prepared an audience for Bellamy's Looking Backward, which promoted socialism even as Bellamy eschewed that term by calling his socialism nationalism. In Bellamy's utopian novel, a man falls asleep in 1888 and awakes in the year 2000, in a world in which cooperation has replaced class conflict and economic competition, and in which inequality and liberty, as defined by liberty of contract, had been banished. Bellamy insisted that freedom was a social condition, resting on interdependence, not autonomy. Bellamy's highly authoritarian utopia, everyone would be constricted, conscripted into his great industrial army controlled by a single government operation is chilling today, but it inspired hundreds of nationalist clubs whose members sought the abundance of industrial capitalism without its inequalities. What one historian calls the Christian lobby promoted political solutions to what it saw as the moral problems raised by labor conflicts, the growth of cities, and the scientific challenges of Darwinism. 
Powerful organizations emerged, including the Women's Christian Temperance Union, National Reform Association, and Reform Bureau, attempted to Christianize the government in order to stamp out personal sin. Diverging from the past, Southern members called for federal regulation of personal behavior. These organizations achieved some notable goals, and their activism led to the Mann Act of 1910 and Prohibition. The clergy also became a source of criticism of social Darwinism and laissez-faire notions of freedom. While most Protestant preachers continued to attack individual sin, a new social gospel took shape in the writings of men like Walter Rauschenbusch, a New York Baptist minister, and Washington Gladden, a congregational clergyman in Columbus, Ohio. They argued that freedom and spiritual self-development required an equalization of wealth and power, and that unregulated capitalism degraded Christian brotherhood. Adherents tried to minister to the needs of the urban poor, attacked child labor, and promoted better working-class housing and health and safety laws. Within American Catholicism as well, a group of priests and bishops emerged who attempted to alter the church's traditional hostility to movements for social reform and its isolation from contemporary currents of social thought. With most of its parishioners working men and women, they argued, the church should lend its support to the labor movement. The social conflicts of the age seemed to culminate in the great labor uprisings of 1886. Western Railroad Union's successful strike against lines controlled by Jay Gould, a powerful financier, inspired workers to join the Knights of Labor by the hundreds of thousands. On May 1, 1886, 350,000 workers across the country went on strike and protested for the eight-hour day. May the 1st, known as May Day, thereafter became an annual holiday of parades and protests by workers around the world. In Chicago, where a vibrant labor movement brought together radical socialists and anarchists, immigrant workers, and native-born anti-monopoly laborites, a strike by iron molders at the giant McCormick plant that produced agricultural machinery turned violent. Company strike breakers and private police battled the strikers, and on May 3, 1886, four strikers were killed by police. A rally held the next day to protest their deaths ended in a bomb explosion. To this day, no one knows the identity of the bomber, and police opened fire, leading to the deaths and injury of more police and bystanders. Police in Chicago and elsewhere used the bombing as an opportunity to arrest and suppress labor radicals. The McCormick strike ended in defeat, and eight anarchists, mostly immigrants, were charged with the bombing. With little evidence and flawed proceedings, they were convicted. Four were hanged, one committed suicide, and the remaining three were imprisoned until their sentences were commuted several years later. The Haymarket martyrs soon became symbols of labor's bloody struggle for rights in America. The Haymarket Affair took place amid multiple efforts across the country by workers, mostly in the Knights of Labor, to run candidates and organize worker-based parties at the local and state levels. The most celebrated campaign took place in 1886 in New York, where Henry George ran for mayor on the United Labor ticket and almost defeated the Democratic candidate. The events of 1886 suggested that labor might become a powerful political force. In fact, the Knights of Labor quickly declined after 1886. Unions began to avoid politics, and the Democrats and Republicans proved successful at winning workers' votes. Nevertheless, the events of the Gilded Age marked a contest over freedom and its social conditions between the forces of social Darwinism and laissez-faire and those who supported collective efforts to establish industrial freedom. So, that's the end of our third section. We'll be back for four. <laughs>